Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Philippe for inviting me and for you all coming to listen. Uh, and yeah, great. Um, and also by, I think for the first time, publicly thanking Majid, who, when I was just starting my book on the Indus Waters dispute, very kindly sent me his PhD on the same topic, even though he hadn't had time to publish anything from it yet, and trusted me not to plagiarize it massively and then put it under my own name. Um, and I'm pretty confident that we've managed to sort of follow a fairly similar trajectory while actually saying different things and not actually overlapping in, even in terms of topic very much. Uh, but I guess we'll let you be the judge of that at the end of this evening. Um, so I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the topic in my second book, but mainly I'll leave this to Majid. And I'm going to talk more about the topic of my first book, which was about barrage irrigation in Sindh, uh, in southern Pakistan, and particularly about the connections between the colonial state as an irrigating hydraulic power and the post-colonial state and thinking about how much actually changed in 1947 with uh, what was ostensibly decolonization through partition. And just to begin with my conclusions, in case I run out of time, because I'm really going to try and cap myself for 15 minutes, so here they are in case uh, we get a bit lost later. So the first thing I want to suggest is that the very idea of natural resources is colonial. Seeing nature as a resource, as Heidegger's standing reserve, is, implies an attempt to extract value, to manipulate landscapes and environmental systems, and as we will see in this context, in the imperial context, very much also about manipulating people. So what we're looking at here is not just um, extracting value, but also changing social and environmental systems. I'll also suggest, with very little evidence, because I'm not actually going to talk about small-scale stuff at all, but it's just a thought to have out there, that I think the lesson of tracing the way that major infrastructure projects developed between the colonial and post-colonial states in Pakistan, and you can do the same for India, demonstrates that it's almost impossible to dissociate these kinds of big dam projects or big barrage project projects from those kinds of power imbalances and reshapings of society and environment uh, that colonial hydrology was all about. So, just to start with a very brief definition, uh, I'm putting this up for convenience sake. Uh, colonial hydrology is a phrase coined by Rohan D'Souza, the famous Indian <coughs> environmental historian, in about 2006, I think this article came out, which summed up the approach of various scholars to what water governance meant under the colonial British in India, in South Asia. And D'Souza argued that although there, were some, um, there was some continuity of traditional irrigation systems, and also I point out that the British canal systems in places especially like Sindh built on their predecessors' canal systems, the ambition, the scope, the scale, and the impacts of colonial irrigation was profound enough and different enough to deserve its own term, colonial hydrology. So we're looking at a combination of technology which is either new or sold as new, um, market-oriented cropping, so this is really important, it's also a capitalist endeavor, um, efforts towards increased social control over irrigators and over agriculturalists, uh, and the institutional reforming of governance. So particularly a shift from the, uh, from the revenue department, in colonial Indian terms, towards the technical departments, the public works department, and that's uh, mainly drawn from ideas by David Gilmartin from the early 90s. And although this work is now pretty old and well established, I still think it's a useful starting point for thinking because I don't think anyone, any of the many people who work on uh, water history in South Asia today have really seriously challenged this framework. I'm going to talk uh, very briefly, you'll be pleased to hear, about three barrage dams which were constructed in Sindh, in southern Pakistan, what is now southern Pakistan, between the 1930s and the 1960s. Uh, the first of these, the Sakha Barrage, was completed in 1932 and was a straightforwardly colonial project, um, several years before partition and decolonization. The second two, the Gula Muhammad Barrage down towards the delta and the Gudu Barrage up there at the top, were 
um, built and completed during the post-colonial period, but based on colonial plans. All of these projects, I argued in my first book, and we continue to stand by the argument today, were at least partly responses to a crisis of legitimacy that the late colonial and early post-colonial states faced. So this was in the face of increasing nationalism, calls for representative government. The state fell back on the claim to logistic expertise and the ability to manipulate environmental flows, such as water resources, um, as a stand-in for meaningful uh, participatory governance. So let's take this first barrage, the Sako Barrage. The political aim of this was to effectively stabilise the, um, the agricultural classes in Sindh and particularly to support the Zamindars, who the British were worried were being undermined by uh, Hindu moneylenders, Bandhas. And the commissioner in Sindh stated this uh, very clearly in 1920 when he was writing in support of the barrage project up to London to try and get it authorised by the Secretary of State for India, which took about a decade. So, as usual, government works very slowly. Even Brexit has taken rather longer than the current <laughs> Prime Minister thought it might. Uh, I won't read this out to you because I'm sure you can read it yourself. But effectively, the idea here was that Development was taking place across India. Sindh needed to be included in order for the British to maintain the loyalty of their key collaborators in the province. But the barrage was also intended to have sweeping effects on the landscape uh, and on the social systems of Sindh as well. Sindh was thought of as basically a wasteland, a sparsely populated desert uh, which only needed the introduction of regular water supplies uh, and also of some good work discipline in order to be one of the breadbaskets of India, to be a, a productive agricultural zone. And this is just one example from reams and reams of colonial discourse, which put forward this idea that the barrage was going to be transformative in Sindh. It would transform the people and it would transform the landscape. Another wonderful quote, which I didn't quite include, uh, was that the dam will um, address the traditional problem in Sindh, which is the, the agriculturalist is only interested in working so long as it uh, is required to keep his hookah filled with tobacco. <clears throat> Fast forward a couple of decades after independence, and two new barrage dams were constructed. At um, Kotri, the Gula Muhammad Barrage, and at Gudu up in North Sint. Both of these were a little smaller than the Sucker Barrage, but they were accompanied by remarkably similar rhetoric. Only now it was framed as a question of nation building, uh, of demonstrating the worth and validity of the Pakistani nation, rather than as an imperialist project. So Iskandar Mirza, the president in 1957, shortly before he launched a coup, which resulted in the first military takeover of Pakistan, argued for the importance of engineers as nation builders. In other words, constructing state power would be an act in concrete as well as an act of bringing together different communities, writing the constitution, which had also just been passed by 1957. And so, <coughs> By the way, I'm assuming that people in this room have quite a lot of background knowledge about um, modern South Asian history, but please give me a wave if I'm skipping over things that need to be covered. All of these barrage dams had significant effects on the uh, demography of Sindh as well. One of the concerns that the colonial government had in Sindh and which uh, was maintained by the post-colonial government was that the province was underpopulated, that there was not a sufficient labour force to work the new um, agricultural opportunities that the dams would open up. I keep saying dams, technically they're barrages, so please forgive me for that. This meant that they looked outside the province to bring in cultivators, particularly to Punjab, uh, which in the case of the Sucker Barrage was a very open uh, policy. The colonial administrators were explicit about the fact that they thought Punjabis were loyal, hardworking, and overall ready for modernity, unlike the Sindhis, who were supposedly backwards, fickle, and lazy. And so they imported Punjabis en masse to settle the uh, barrage irrigation zone. It's been much more difficult to get uh, figures, proper figures, out of the post-colonial government. And there was certainly a bit more tact around the way it was phrased. 
but it seems that a lot of the land was allocated to uh, retired army personnel, which is likely to mean Punjabis and Pashtuns, so probably not Sindhis. Really annoyingly, in all my PhD fieldwork in Sindh, I was unable to find anyone who could point to any Punjabis in, in Sindh and say, right, this is where the people who came over to do the barrage cultivation were. So either they left again or they kind of integrated and lost that separate identity. So the continuity between, um, in the rhetoric, the aims and the methods of colonial and post-colonial irrigation projects is one way that colonial hydrology remained alive in Pakistan after independence. But I also want to put forward what may be a slightly more controversial point, which is to see Pakistan's major dam project in Azad Kashmir in the 1950s and 60s as an exercise in colonial power. As you all probably know, Kashmir was contested between India and Pakistan after independence. Pakistan did not formally claim sovereignty over Kashmir, merely that uh, Kashmir should be an independent country with Pakistani support. In practice, the Ministry of Kashmir Affairs, based in Karachi, later in Islamabad, um, played a major role in staffing the civil service in Azad Kashmir um, and tended to intervene quite heavily in politics. And one of the projects that the West Pakistani authorities, WAPDA, the Water and Power Development Authority, executed was this dam, the Mangla Dam, um, in Mirpur, just on the, the border between Punjab and Kashmir. This uh, prompted quite a lot of um, discontent among the inhabitants of Mirpur town. Uh, roughly 90,000 people in the end were displaced by this project. And there was a series of protest meetings through the late 1950s. Uh, which were eventually successfully suppressed by the authorities, the Azad Kashmir and Pakistan authorities. And this, uh, this construction of the dam, which was going to be a really important part of the new Pakistani water supply system, which was designed to meet the apparent threat coming down from India in the context of the Indus dispute, which Majid will fill you in on, was framed again as a question of nation building, as a way of literally joining uh, Azad Kashmir to West Pakistan through the irrigation system. <coughs> and again, just as one example of the voluminous rhetoric that surrounded this project, um, the chief engineer of the Mangla <coughs> Dam paid glowing tribute to the people of Azad Kashmir who had sacrificed everything for the good of the nation. And this kind of language continues right through the 60s and even into the 70s when um, under Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the cabinet was still discussing the question of properly compensating the displaced Mirpuris in recognition of their sacrifice for the good of the nation. But being an environmental historian, I don't want to give the impression that colonial hydrology and post-colonial hydrology was merely an exercise in the state exerting total power and uh, simply manipulating the people or the natural environment. These complex systems could not really be um, overwhelmed and simply put to use in the way that uh, hydrology, hydro, excuse me, the way that water planners might have wanted. And actually, I wouldn't suggest that water development in South Asia has ever been that kind of attempt to really uh, entirely capture a landscape, a people, and an ecosystem that James Scott famously described in his work on high modernism in seeing like a state. The aims were always much more limited. But even in the context of an attempt merely to intervene in the water supply system in order to reward some collaborators and uh, produce more and more profitable cash crops, nature fought back, if you will. So by the mid-1960s, coming back downstream to Sims, at the same time that the Gudu barrage was being completed, water logging, drain it, and Salinity became the key agricultural problem in southern Pakistan and in large parts of Punjab as well. And President Ayub Khan, who declared himself president after uh, launching his military coup in 1958, by the 60s was describing the war on salinity and on soil degradation as a battle for survival. So again, framing this kind of humans versus nature and particularly the state versus nature uh, in exactly the same kinds of militaristic terms that the colonial and post-colonial state had used for irrigation, but inverting the relationship between humans and a beneficent nature that just needed a bit of water and a bit of work to yield its bounty, and a threatening nature that was um, 
in the business of putting humans out of business. And this is why, in a nutshell, I'm arguing that decolonial resources governments would need to be smaller scale. The logic, the rhetoric, and the aims of these kinds of very large uh, infrastructure projects tend to cause a power imbalance, partly because they're located in specific places, and I suspect Majid might talk about that a little bit more, but I'd be happy to chat about it in the Q&A at the end. Um, and partly because the ways of thinking that dominated the water bureaucracy in Pakistan, and you could say the same for India after independence, remained rooted in these colonial models of what irrigation development was supposed to be doing and why it was necessary and valuable. I'll leave it there. Over to Majid. Um, I don't have slides, um, but I'll just talk and hopefully that will be enough to uh, keep you interested. Um, so, first of all, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak and uh, thank you for the very kind introduction as well to Dan. It's been uh, great having someone to talk to over the years working on something very related. Um, so I will say I'm very uh, happy to see such a big turnout. I think I was going by King standards, uh, so there wouldn't have been that many people if I were at King's, but it'll teach me to underestimate the engagement of SOAS in the future. So very nice to see you all here. <laughs> okay, so much of what I'm gonna mention here will uh, be a review for many of you in the room, I imagine. Uh, but what I'm gonna try to do is to tease out some of the larger themes and maybe end up with a bit of a discussion or a bit of a question on what we even mean when we say decolonizing. Um, because I'm sure you've noticed this concept has spread like wildfire, universities are stumbling over themselves to fund projects with <coughs> decolonial in front of it, which should make us wary. Um, so I want to sort of, sort of situate our own intellectual moment a bit at the end and say why um, this word has kind of been picked up not only from bottom up, but increasingly from top down as well. Um, so I think that's something, for those of us who see some radical potential in this idea of decolonizing, um, it's important, I think, to be uh, aware of the moment we're in where this word is being used a lot. Um, and I say this as someone who just got funding to do something on decolonizing <laughs> political economy myself. So um, the old academics trick of being reflexive. Um, so I'll begin uh, upstream from where uh, Dan took us in Sindh, and which is to the province of Punjab. And uh, for those of you uh, may be familiar uh, with Pakistani history and politics, you know that Punjab is historically the dominant province. Um, and this uh, one story would have it that this begins with the canal colonization and the railroadization of Punjab under the British Empire in the late 19th century. And it's actually uh, Imran Ali's classic book on this topic that was kind of my introduction to this field of agrarian history of Punjab. And if you haven't read it, it's, it's the place to begin, I would say, in this area. And one of the themes that I want to draw through, because I'm going to talk about canal colonization in Punjab, the geopolitical context of the Indus Water Treaty, and uh, I, in my opinion, more importantly, the Indus Basin Project, which was the suite of infrastructural projects that were funded alongside the Indus Water Treaty. Um, a little bit about the colonial present um, on the Indus, so relationships between states and nominally citizens that look like colonialism. Um, a little bit about a, um, the dispossessed in, in the sense of a, colonial present again, and how this relates to environment and water. Um, this is, has to do with livelihood struggles, and which are people in the room who can speak to that much better than I can, but I'll just gesture at these concerns. Um, and then finally end up on a little bit about what it means to decolonize natural resource governance, and maybe I'll, I'll throw out a couple of polemical points there about small scale and state power and um, attitudes towards the state. <laughs> and the theme that I want to kind of uh, string through this all is that of technocracy. So I think in standard 
critical, at least, Pakistani history and social science, the two major sources of power are often landlord power and military power. And those are really important points of analysis and stories to tell. But I'm going to bring in a third strand here, which we saw a lot of evidence in Dan's talk as well, well, the quotes of the engineers, which is the power of technocracy, right? The, the legitimacy to rule based on um, superior knowledge or better knowledge. Um, so along with the canal colonization of the Punjab, which, which, which was an agricultural settling and which was a freezing and assigning of private property rights, which whenever you assign property rights, you're dispossessing as well. So there was a mass dispossession of the, uh, if you like, indigenous people who lived in this area before, the pastoral tribes, and many migrants coming from, again, mi migration of Punjabis coming from East Punjab at the time, which was described as overcrowded. So these new colonies were formed. And actually, my family was a part of that migration as well in the early 20th centuries, moving from uh, Jalandhar to Okara. So it's kind of a story that's in, in my family. And the power, what I want to emphasize, not only the dispossession and the freezing of power, uh, property rights, which is very clearly a colonial activity, but also the power of irrigation officials in these canal colonies. Um, the Irrigation and Drainage, uh, sorry, the Canal and Irrigation Drainage <coughs> Act of 1867 um, has been amended various times, most lately, uh, most lately in 2016. But what this act does is it actually gives a lot of power to the irrigation and canal officers. Um, to the point where there was, if you had a dispute concerning canal water, you wouldn't take it to a civil court, you would take it to the canal irrigation officer, and they had magisterial powers to which there was no appeal. So if you can imagine a system of law which is <coughs> rooted somehow in British uh, common law tradition, but then it takes the authoritarian turn in the colonial context, and a lot of power is actually vested in the irrigation canal officers, and uh, this influence lasts up to the current day. Right? And this is also, Talbot has called this the Punjab school of administration. Very top down, very authoritarian, and um, I mean that's colonial rule in general, but in Punjab this was especially marked. And this resulted in a, uh, the legacies of which we are still living with, a military agrarian nexus <coughs> to which I would add technocratic nexus. Military agrarian technocratic nexus which assumes um, power and superior knowledge and the right to intervene um, in nature and in society in order to modernize or develop the country. And basically in my articles I, I, I argue that this is a extremely misguided approach to governance and it has resulted in just problem after problem for the ruling elite in Pakistan and which has resulted in a lot of conflict and contradictions in the method of governing in the country. So fast forward uh, from the late 19th to the middle of the 20th when you have partition and basically the Indus River which uh, basically spans uh, Punjab, uh, trans, trans regional Punjab, which was a domestic river beforehand. It was also in some princely states, but by and large administered as an integrated unit by the British. This becomes an international river um, by the stroke of a pen with Radcliffe's line. And all of a sudden, you have this conflict between upstream and downstream geopolitical entities that are governed differently. So upstream, downstream is, is uh, and not to get too deep into the weeds here, but upstream on a river basin tends to have more power than downstream because you can divert waters, but the downstream can't do that to the upstream, right? So this, uh, there's basically nested upstream-downstream relations between Punjab and Sindh on the national scale and then between Pakistan and India on the international scale. So the Indus Water Treaty was um, the result of a decade of negotiations. Actually, you can take the negotiations back to the 1930s when talking about um, um, Sutlej Valley Project and you know the debates between the provinces go back before then. But basically, it looks like this debate is this problem is not going to be solved. So what happens? The problem becomes internationalized, and what is enrolled is basically international expertise. So again, this theme of expertise as a means to depoliticize and resolve problems that are at their roots are inherently political. 
By political, I mean you're dealing with uneven power relations. And the refusal to confront uneven power relations is kind of the fiction that technocracy allows, right? Technocracy says, here's a problem, there's an optimal solution, why are we even talking about politics or religion or, any, or anything else, really, when there's an optimal solution that the engineer can crunch? And uh, basically, David Lilienthal, who headed up the Tennessee Valley Authority in the 1930s US, and who later got fame as the head of the Atomic Energy Commission, he, wrote, he did a tour. He was a celebrity in the decolonizing world at this time. He was visiting Southeast Asia, South Asia, South Asia Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana was calling for him. Basically, all these decolonizing elites were saying, do what you did in Tennessee. Let's do that here for us, right? This is our golden ticket. Um, and Nehru, you know, famously was very much kind of a fan of these sorts of large hydro projects. So Lilienthal got brought in, and to make a long story short, the, the Indus Water Treaty and the Indus Basin Plan, which brought in, in today's money, about 30 billion US dollars, and which was at the time the largest integrated civil engineering program in the world. It was conducted in, in the Indus Valley uh, at this time. It was enabled basically by the Cold War context, about this fear that if we don't, we being the international community, which means America and its allies and kind of the emerging world order, that if we don't do something to diffuse tensions, we're going to lose India and we're going to lose Pakistan. So who are we going to lose it to is communism or to socialism because of the threat of China around the corner. And this is explicit. This is not kind of a, my own kind of reading into it. It's in the archives. These concerns are very, very explicit. Um, David Lilienthal wrote an article um, calling for something like the Indus Water Treaty in which he said, are we going to lose uh, India like we lost Korea, right? So it's all kind of a Cold War calculation. And basically, the money also came from rich Commonwealth countries in the US to fund these large dams and replacement works. So that is the geopolitical enabling context. It's relying on international expertise, a supposedly depoliticized expertise. And also, on the domestic scale, it's teaming up with a Yukon dictatorship, right? And especially the formation of one unit, which, again, pretended that because the Indus Basin has a natural unity, this should be mirrored in an administrative unity. And these Sindhis and other people who have provincial identities, they're living in the past. They should join this new future in which it's one Pakistan, or at least in the West, one Pakistan, revolving around the, the unity of the Indus Basin. The fact that much of Balochistan is not in the Indus Basin is, is another story. Um, but Basically, it was authoritarianism at home and Cold War calculations abroad that enabled the Indus Water Treaty and the Indus Basin Plan. And the strand of technocracy that runs through this and military dictatorship is a continuation of patterns that were set in the colonization of, of Punjab. So moving on from the Indus Water Treaty and Indus Basin Plan, of which Mangla Dam was one of the, the dams and Tarbela Dam was the other. These were the two big projects that came out of that, um, came out of that funding. And um, in sitting in, in the UK, uh, many of you might know that actually this is kind of a global connected history, that many of the people who were displaced by Mangla Dam, Mangla Dam in Mirpur ended up coming to become the working classes in the Midlands in the UK through a visa voucher scheme. And I think some people have written about this, but not enough, really, because this is a very interesting story um, about dams, displacement, development across borders, and kind of a post-colonial relationship between uh, working class in Pakistan and development of dams in the country. So moving on to the colonial present, sticking to the Indus Water Treaty, um, those relations that were cemented in the Indus, text of the Indus Water Treaty, they continue to shape relations between Pakistan and India today. And you can see this very clearly in two of the recent cases that went up for international arbitration under the guidelines set out by the Indus Water Treaty. These are the Bugliar Dam, which went up for uh, arbitration or uh, adjudication, I should say, in 2005, and the Kishanganga Dam, which, which went up in 2010. So the reason I say that this is continuing the colonial tradition of technocracy is because the guidelines of the Indus Water Treaty are very clear. Is that if you have a 
Um, I won't go into the details. I have an article I recently published about this in Environment and Planning E, but basically the dispute resolution mechanisms, that the lower tier is very much uh, diverted to technocracy. So basically you, you find the parties have to agree on a prominent engineer to arbitrate the case. <laughs> So already you can see the problems. And the person who ended up arbitrating it, uh, Raymond Lafitte, was a Swiss civil engineer who had no expertise in South Asia, nothing, no knowledge of the background, nothing what was going on. Um, so I think in the minds of some people, similar with Radcliffe, the idea was outsider, expert, therefore objective. Right? So it's a very, it's trying to wish away the underlying fundamental politics of the situation. Um, and then the Kishanganga arbitration was also composed of various experts, but there was a bit more leeway there to introduce um, kind of uh, juris jurisprudential thinking or kind of juristical thinking, more flexibility to acknowledge basically the rights of the downstream. Um, so we can talk more about Bhagli and Kishanganga if people are interested, um, but basically I think because Kishanganga allowed more recognition of the political protection of downstream actors, um, it was ultimately a bit of a, um, let's say, more honest reckoning of what's going on. Although, to call it that is a bit of a stretch, but relative to Buglia, at least. Um, so I think that really shows the way that technocracy, colonial technocracy, continues on in the way the state is governed today, especially in relation to the Indus Water Treaty. Um, the continuation of the Irrigation and Canal Drainage Act, and then uh, basically the continued power also of um, landlords and waterlords, right? Obviously a lot has changed. There are new power factions as well. Um, landlord power and industrial power, military power, the lines are blurry. New classes have also emerged. But you can see within all this the foundations of that colonial project of producing a militarily agrarian stable region. Um, in South Asia. And this is kind of the legacy that Pakistani Federation has suffered uh, from ever since, I would say. Um, to turn a little bit now to uh, um, the dispossessed in contemporary Pakistan, so um, I want to kind of challenge this category of colonial, or not challenge, but kind of expand it a bit, to not only talk about something in the past, um, something that Europeans did to Africans and Asians, you know, it's not that simple, actually. When we think about colonial power, we might want to think of it as um, economic, or the way that I'm beginning to think of it as economic exploitation without political inclusion, or subordinated political inclusion. So in other words, your labor, your resources are being exploited, but you're not being brought into the political system on equal footing. Um, so with this broader definition, it doesn't have to be one state invading another. You can have a phenomenon called internal colonialism, which a lot of uh, black Americans have written very eloquently about uh, based on their own history, and also Puerto Rican Americans. This idea of an internal colony, that you're exploited, your labor is exploited, your resources are exploited, but you're not brought in in a fully franchised sort of way. And this sort of relationship continues in Pakistan. Um, and you can see this uh, sticking just to kind of water-related issues. Um, you can see it in seawater intrusion in the Indus Delta, which has destroyed the livelihoods of many uh, uh, fisher folk in the region. And there are people here who can talk more about that. Um, and the kind of, um, this has been done by kind of over-interventions upstream, where the seawater has been coming in. The kind of estuary ecosystem is very fragile. You have to have certain what are called environmental flows that maintain the balance between sea and freshwater. Um, so that balance has been disturbed um, to the detriment of uh, many of the poorest people. Um, you can think about what's on the books right now, the North Indus Cascade. So this is kind of a shadowy fantasy fever dream of the Pakistani state um, that there's going to be a string of dams in uh, Gilgit Baltistan that will basically be the new linchpin of hydropower in Pakistan, funded in large part uh, through CPEC, is the idea. Um, but again, we hit across the colonial uh, nature of this development intervention, because Gilgit Baltistan is not a uh, equal is not on equal footing with the rest of Pakistan. Right? It's not constitutionally. It's not 
Um, it's ethnic minority as well. There's lots of kind of colonial power relations going on there. And these dams are going to flood areas. They're going to cause problems downstream. But of course, none of that is being taken into account. It's more the experts are saying it's OK, so let's just carry on. And everyone else can kind of get on board afterwards. And then finally, the issue of glacier melt. Right? So this is going to be a big issue in the next couple decades in Pakistan. If you look at uh, different kind of interpretations of glacier melt, you, you'll find a little variation. Right? Some people say that in um, the western Karakoram, <coughs> glaciers are actually growing a little bit. You know, you'll find little controversies like this. But overall, the glaciers are melting, which means there might be in the short run more flow, but in the long run less flow because glaciers are basically storage, right? They store up water in the winter and then release it slowly over the summer. So it's kind of a natural built-in buffer, smoother of flows. Um, so glacier melt due to global climate change is going to really change the game, not only in the Indus Basin, but on all the rivers that stem out of the Tibetan Plateau, on which about 50% of the world's population rely for subsistence in China, Southeast Asia, India, and Pakistan. So this is not something small villages somewhere. This is half the world's population is going to be impacted by this glacier melt in, in the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau more generally. OK, so just I've gone a little bit over. I just want to uh, finish up a little bit on decolonizing natural resources. Um, on the one hand, I do think that, uh, I think often when we talk about decolonizing in universities, what we're talking about is epistemic hierarchy, right? Uh, some ways of knowing are better than other ways of knowing. So that might be something like a modernist, developmentalist, etc. scientific people know better how to understand nature and develop it than, let's say, uh, traditional livelihood users who have been using that fishing area or grazing land or whatever it may be, there's an epistemic hierarchy. Some ways of knowing are better than others. Um, I think that's great. I think that's a really powerful critique. Um, but I don't actually think it stops there. I don't think that is enough. I think I prefer, rather than decolonization, um, anti-colonial um, anti activity, just more broadly. Because to me, and, and we can talk about this, decolonization has a bit of going, like, wiping the slate clean and going back to something, um, which I'm, I'm, I'm pretty uncomfortable with, actually. So I would prefer, um, and maybe people who use the word don't mean it that way, but I think it's kind of built into the syntax. And I, would, I, I think I gravitate more towards just anti-colonialism, because that way it's not something consigned to the past. That way there's no imagined pure beginning to go back to. Um, what you're thinking about, rather, is concerns of democratic inclusion, ending economic exploitation, and basically, I mean, these are struggles that can happen in, in many contexts. Um, so I think I, I prefer that framing. Um, maybe I'm missing something about the decolonial, um, but, but maybe we can talk more about that as well. Also, decolonial has multiple trajectories, right? There's South African trajectory, there's Native American trajectory, there's UK universities. People in different parts of the world are using this word <coughs> differently. And then the role of the state. And I'll end here, uh, because the call that we received was kind of talking about um, kind of resisting the state as the um, manager and developer of natural resources and kind of developing local scale responses instead. Um, I don't think it's actually that easy. Um, I think we live in a world where state, capital, and nation are kind of interlocked together. I don't think any of these can be transcended just by an act of will. I think state power is a terrain for struggle, um, just as, as is na nationalism itself. So when we talk about anti-colonial activity, I think we have to rethink state relations instead of ignoring it or trying to act without attracting its attention. And for me, this involves uh, something of an internationalist sort of strategy. So you have to de-link political community from the administrative apparatus of the state itself. And the, a concrete example that I think um, would be interesting is to look at the state of tailenders in both Indian and Pakistani Punjab. Right? Tailenders are those farmers 
who are at the end of a canal. So on the, on the scale of the canal, they're downstream. They're at the very end of the canal. And so they often get very unreliable um, <coughs> water supplies. And they also tend to be, not completely, but they do tend to be smaller and poorer farmers, but not in every case. Um, so I think, actually, tailenders in Indian Punjab and Pakistani Punjab have more in common with each other than actually a large farmer in Punjab than they would with a large farmer in either of their places, right? So there is a livelihood, class, commonality of interest there that is transcending the kind of the inbred kind of um, ingrained sort of anti-state narrative. Um, so that's just one, I mean, this is completely speculative. I'm not, I'm not involved in any of this organizing, but that's an example of something that you might turn to to have an international coordinated pressure on the state. I think that is something of a more interesting trajectory um, than uh, perhaps just avoiding the state or ignoring it. Um, so I'll leave it there. Where do you see the difference? Um, okay. The decolonizing is actually, as you say, looking backwards and actually trying to unravel some of the stuff that's gone before that actually has a continuing um, impact. Okay. And decolonizing is actually challenging the new forms that are growing up. Now, some of the new forms growing up, yes, have their um, genesis in the past, but actually, there are also new ones coming up that are actually that, that, are, that are new. And so, I think it's it, it's um, and you know, I'm at the age where I can live with different different things. Um, uh, yeah, they all have their validity. That would be my perspective. Uh, yes, I, I, I agree, yes. Uh, the, the short answer is I agree. <laughs> but uh, for, for the sake of uh, kind of, uh, I guess it's a bit of a polemic argument that I'm making, for the sake of kind of uh, trying to figure out what is it about this moment which makes decolonizing such an attractive proposition, not only to <coughs> students and the oppressed and subordinated, but also to people in power. I'm speaking of our universities. Why would you use the term um, decolonizing? Because it's not decolonization as opposed to exploitation? Um, is, that's for me? Um, I mean, I, I, I think uh, the word decolonization is overused. Yeah. Uh, I think exploitation, to me, I mean, uh, coming out of a kind of a Marxist tradition, it has a very economic sort of understanding of where you're taking use of someone's labor without paying them for it fully. So I think of it as an economic category when I say exploitation. The political side of that might be something like domination. Um, I mean, they're, they're always kind of related. Um, and then decolonizing, to me, it's, uh, that's what I'm trying to figure out myself, actually. Uh, I mean, I understand that it's, it's a politicizing term, which is good, but, um, yeah. Can I ask, are there any other historians in the room, apart from me? Um, 
only historian, that's quite interesting because in history, decolonization means something pretty specific, which is the end of formal European power in Africa and Asia between the sort of, oh, and I suppose, depending on your approach, if you want to include the white colonies, Oceania, Oceania from roughly 1920 through to about 1970. And so we don't really have these debates about <clears throat> decolonizing the mind or really thinking through the kind of embeddedness of continued colonial structures of power and knowledge in post-colonial settings. And until very recently, decolonization history was really a kind of um, international or diplomatic history by another name. And it's only quite recently that we've begun looking at the culture of decolonization, social histories of decolonization, and so on. So it was until pretty recently heavily about white dudes sitting around in conference rooms making decisions. It's quite refreshing to hear like, the disciplines. But, but we can have an argument about how uh, the scriptures can actually that arise in one area of thought, mm -hmm. then get transmitted and used in another one. Mm -hmm. you see, it isn't just about economics, although economics is a big thing about it, but it encompasses a whole range of thought um, behind <coughs> how different people were described, different people were seen, even different people who were allowed in certain spaces uh, be, um, I mean, I had an interesting uh, discussion uh, yesterday um, with someone who's doing military history and even the business of military history and who was in the military and who wasn't is about who was um, admitted into, uh, so there's an issue about who was admitted in uh, the military but also who was recognized to be in the military when you're looking at military history. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, you know, perhaps I'm, I, the beauty about my position is I'm not, uh, I don't see it sitting in these little silos. I can see the interconnectedness across, and yes. Um, but thank you, it's been a very, very interesting discussion. And I'm actually here because of the, um, what you're talking about has implications for so many other deltas around, mm -hmm. including the um, parts of uh, Africa, particularly Nigeria. Thank you. I'm a lot of here already, but I'm, when I'm, uh, I'm studying, I study a little bit ancient history, and uh, especially Greek and Egypt. When the Greeks arrived mm -hmm. in Egypt, and they started to exploit the Fayum Delta, and uh, in some respects, uh, for might be wrong, I don't know what the story of you were telling us uh, this afternoon tonight. We're actually reminiscent of, uh, of the phenomenon. <coughs> but my question is, there are, in this phenomenon in ancient history, there are usually two things that happen, for instance, in Greek Egypt, uh, which creates academic debate. The first one is, uh, okay, to what extent was this uh, exploitation of natural resource of colonization, which is some ancient historian uh, increasingly use, of course, the word colonization. Was it deliberate or not? I mean, from the slides and the quotes, it seems to be very, very deliberate. But I mean, <coughs> there is a debate I know among ancient historians about that type of thing. Was it deliberate uh, Roman Empire and Romanization? So, my question is uh, this is my first question. And the second thing, what happened in Greek Egypt is that there has also been an integration of the people. The people came to work on the, in this field, they settled, and the, the, the then they be, you know, there's a debate about at to which level this society became something different from traditional Egypt, but became by by national or by cultural society. So those two phenomenon is that something that which could be related to what. Uh, I think the. <coughs> One of the really weird things about colonial India is how few British people were there. So, I can't remember exactly the figure off the top of my head, some 0, 0 something of the population were ever um, European, as in white, in India. And so, this kind of question of the relationship between the reservation of 
power to this tiny elite who were all basically white, and then everybody else prevented kinds of integration that I think were much more common in other imperial settings, including elsewhere in the British Empire, like South Africa. Even Kenya had a substantial South <coughs> population, um, although there wasn't a sense of demographic replacement in the same way as in the Americas and Australasia. So I, I actually find um, talking about Indian history increasingly difficult to find analogies with other imperial contexts. Um, and I've learned this because I now get told to teach imperial history broadly to uh, global history students at Bristol. Uh, and so I have to think about other contexts. Um, just a question for Dr. Haynes here. When you said at the start that natural resources are a colonial concept, can you just elaborate on that a bit more? Yeah, so I think very much picking up on what Majid has pointed out as if you look at the natural environment as one of the kind of arenas for conflict between political interests. Exploiting natural resource, thinking about nature as an exploitable resource rather than as just part of the local world, if that makes sense, um, requires that kind of power imbalance. And so the classic and much maligned for a lot of good reasons work on water and political power in Asia is Karl Wittfogel's um, Oriental Despotism, a book which I only read because when I studied my PhD on uh, water and sin, the only thing anyone would ever say is, isn't there that book by Karl Wittfogel called Oriental Despotism? Is that what your work's about? And so I had to read it. Um, and it's mostly nonsense, but it does contain, as in it's bad history, it's not any uh, And it's explicitly geared towards explaining totalitarianism in 1950s USSR and China through ancient history, which is you know, an approach. <clears throat> Not one I encourage my students to take. Um, which very powerfully makes the point that controlling a resort, controlling something like water flows gives people enormous amounts of power. And actually this idea has been much more subtly uh, updated and made, I think, more useful for environmental historians and perhaps for others by um, the US historian <coughs> Donald Worcester, who wrote a book called Rivers of Empire in the 1980s or 90s, I forget which, basically arguing that the image we have of the American West being a land of cowboys and freedom is completely mistaken because the expansion of white settler power in the American West, so thinking about California, Utah, Arizona, dry states like that, um, was based on corporatism, uh, as in corporations, capitalist corporations, and strong state authority, which was designed to construct new irrigation systems. And so actually this wasn't the land of freedom and cowboys, but actually of pretty strong state control, um, which instituted a colonial relationship, as he puts it, between the densely populated, wealthy, Eastern Seaboard, where all the capital was, and the West, where all the labor was, and also where all the uh, natural resources were. And so it's this kind of modernist and basically capitalist exploitation of nature, I think, is fundamental to the way we think about resources. And again, I need to credit Margit, because um, he always pointed out that I don't think enough about capitalism when I talk about international water disputes. And actually, it, a lot of it comes down to money, and also global circuits of finance which are necessary for this kind of very large-scale exploitation of the natural environment. Yeah, and I think, I think the example of natural resources also shows the tight linkages between capital and colonialism as well. I think in history and in theory, actually, increasingly it's being recognized that these two logics are, are, are intertwined. Um, if you read um, uh, Black Marxism, um, is an excellent book, and that actually lays out the history of how colonialism within Europe was always at the heart of capitalism from the beginning, and, uh, and racialization, and you, the same argument can be extended to natural resources as well. Okay, then one, two, three. Okay, first, um, I'm a third year IR student. So uh, it's really interesting that you mentioned the geopolitical context. And um, you addressed India, but I feel like 
we need to address the Afghanistan issue as well, because would I be right in saying that India are planning to build quite a lot of dams in Afghanistan? Wouldn't that impact, <coughs> considering that the Kabul River will flow into the Indus, would that not impact the West of Pakistan, which is, you know, Yes, yes, it would. Actually, the Kabul River, uh, which falls into the Indus um, from the west, is not covered in the Indus Border Treaty. It's a major tributary that's not part of the Indus Border Treaty. So it is a big factor. I mean, in general, I mean, kind of in the mind of uh, a paranoid Pakistani state official, India is doing a pincer movement, yeah. you know, coming from both sides. Um, but I think... Yeah, it's, it's a complicated question. I mean, I, I don't know the answer except to kind of con confirm that it is a growing issue. And, and this is just speculation, but it also kind of explains one of the reasons why Pakistan wants to have some semblance of control over what happens in Afghanistan. I mean, there's lots of reasons for that, but the material reason of water flows is often not mentioned a lot, and same goes for Kashmir as well, actually. I mean, Kashmir is often boiled down to an emotional, or religious, or historical, or something like that, but it's actually quite concrete. You know, the Indus, much of the Indus waters flow through Kashmir. And the Indus Water Treaty was very careful, um, had, as, as Dan's written about in his book, to suspend or the question of Kashmir to solve the water stuff. So this is a quite incredible feat to take a river and the valley it's in and separate them on paper so you can do this agreement. But that's exactly the fiction that everyone went along with. Can I also can I just add that as well? Um, it's not only Afghanistan to also think about but China too. Because the, uh, the Indus main stem rises out of that. Do any of the other West Rivers rise into that? I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I think only uh, Ravi and Sutlej come yeah, from India, yeah. the rest are from India. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, the great irony of David Lilienthal's plan for the Indus Basin, which Majid just talked about, is that he was advocating integrated development across the whole Indus Basin. The Indus Waters Treaty is not integrated development, it's partitioned development. So, the whole point was that Indian and Pakistani engineers would have to talk to each other as little as humanly possible to make it work. Um, but it also completely ignored two out of the four riparian states on the Indus Basin. So, um, that, I guess, is a great example of that <coughs> process of simplification and how it has these uh, unintended consequences. So can I just follow up, like, why do you think Pakistan isn't, or in some sense, that you could say it is following up on that, but why is, like, you don't see dialogue between Pakistan and Afghanistan on the water issue, but... I mean, if I had to guess, I would say that Afghanistanis don't trust Pakistan for very good reasons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, and you can say the same about uh, Sindh and Punjab, you know, um, there is IRSA, Ir Indus River System Authority, that allocates water between the provinces, and you know they brought in water meters, they brought in all sorts of technical quick fixes, but you still have disputes, and it's because <coughs> the fundamental political issues have not been resolved. So you can put as much technology and measurement on top of it, but if there's not underlying feeling of mutual interest. Um, then, you, then these disputes will continue, I think, yeah. But it's also worth mentioning that um, Pakistan's approach has generally been reactive rather than proactive. So the Indus Basin dispute started in 1948 because India, Indian engineers shut off supplies into Aikman. Yeah. They got a kick up the backside in the early 50s because India announced it was going to build the Bakra Dam in Hima, what is now Himachal Pradesh, and so on and so forth. So I think until Afghanistan actually builds down, Pakistan Policymakers have plenty else to worry about. Hi there, thank you for your talk. Um, just a few quick questions and points. Uh, the first one is um, how has thinking or rethinking about um, colonial afterlife and in space and maybe you rethink the relationship between empire, state, and post coloniality? Um, Second question, um, to what extent do you see similarities and differences in the kind of technocratic uh, projects of both the British and the American kind of modernization infrastructure that takes place in Pakistan in the 50s and 60s? Um, 
so fascinating to hear your points about the canal dam coordinators and the leverage that they were able to pursue. That kind of reminded me of, of the, kind of the next wave after that of the kind of US Harvard School economists that come in and start replanning the, the yeah. situation. So the kind of shift from the British and the growing of the Europeans towards this kind of US techno technocracy and its impact um, in this kind of agriculture, industrial, state, society uh, contingency, how that kind of Anglo-American transition yeah. um, takes place and to what extent does kind of, do Pakistanis have a leverage in navigating that geopolitical choice? And thirdly, my last question, um, well, two more points, but um, when you were talking about kind of decolonial um, and, and anti-colonial, um, it makes me think that it, when I think about uh, decolonization in the academy, it's either this kind of very recent trend within, within universities to talk about decolonizing our minds, uh, or it's a historical kind of focus on certain specific temporal frames where conferences happen and, and uh, decolonization is sorted on a geopolitical level. But Pakistan is an example where that decolonization happens way before this kind of 50s, 60s high point of decolonial activity. So it makes me think that um, uh, decolonization and this kind of anti-colonial anti thing to me sounds more assertive. You know, we're going to make changes and inroads in our disciplines, but we also need to think about how decolonization is a term that we use maybe as diasporas here in a different context, but how is that con concept understood by Pakistanis living there? Uh, great, great questions. I'll, I'll answer them uh, uh, as, as concisely as I can. First on <coughs> empire, state, and nation. Um, I think it has really changed the way that I think about uh, these categories. Um, and I'm really influenced by a uh, Chinese scholar, Wang Wei. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but uh, W-A-N-G, then the last name is H-U-I. He's a very prominent uh, leftist thinker in China, historian and literary critic. And he's basically argued in the case of China that you can't even think of it as a nation state in the same way that we think of somewhere like France or Belgium or you know these types of things. He's basically saying this is still an imperial entity, but it's taken on the trappings of statehood and nationhood. But it functions in its relationships to its peripheries and relationships to its ethnic minorities, in, in many ways. The way that power and history work in China, Wang Wei argues, it's more of a empire still. That's, that's the way it is. And I would say that that probably a, a accounts for many of the things that we like to call so-called nation states. You know, I mean, first of all, the idea of nation is, um, um, that's something that I think we do need to decolonize our minds from because <coughs> The nation is not the state. You know, the nation is a political, imagined political community. Because it's imagined doesn't make it any, more important, any less important, but nevertheless, it's a political, ideological sort of thing. Um, whereas the state is a fiscal and military apparatus. Um, so the state tries to capture, monopolize nationalism. And it does that by stamping out alternative narratives, especially for minorities. So I think to me, like, when we talk about imperial power, it is important to talk about internal colonies and to speak of existing nation states as actually still and still acting as empires. I, I, that's uh, to, to me the line has become very blurry. There's no empires where then nation states are now. I think I'm less convinced. On the technocratic projects, that that's a brilliant point. I think there's a lot to be written, especially about the Harvard School experts who came in. Um, the Ravel Report, I think it's called, was a massive like three-volume report on groundwater resources um, done by Harvard and USAID. Um, a real critical history of that has yet to be written. The sources are there. The secondary material is there. That's a really nice project waiting for someone. Um, and something similar, I would say, just while, while I have your attention, and some of you might be looking for projects, is the SCARP tube wells. Uh, the, sal the Salinity Control and Reclamation Project tube wells in Pakistan, which came in the 70s and were privatized by the late 80s, I think. No one has written about these in a kind of a critical, substantial way, but there's a story there about 
a public response to environmental degradation and then the hollowing out of that response that I think someone could write about. And then finally on decolonization and what it means, I mean, I'm not <coughs> anti the term, I just find it interesting to think through and to situate a bit. Um, to me, what the term adds over other academic terms is, the, is praxis, basically, is that there is an impetus towards action in it. And especially in the North American strand of, of uh, decolonize, it's not only about epistemic hierarchies, it's about land rights, it's about economic sovereignty, it's about original inhabitants. So if we take that sort of thinking into universities, the question then becomes, who works here? Whose labor makes this place run? And uh, what natural resources and land make it run? And how do we equalize and be inclusive in those relations? So it's not just theorizing. It's also what makes this actual physical space run? And you don't have to look very hard to see that it's um, a lot of underpaid racialized labor that makes it run. A question right at the back. Oh yeah, mine was just about a book that I think Dr. Dean's mentioned. Were you mentioning a book about the American West and capitalism, or did I miss? Rivers of Empire by Donald Wester. Okay, the, sorry, say that again? Rivers of Empire. Okay, Rivers. Thank you. Um, so guys, can I sort of pick your brain a bit about sort of uh, the present colonial moment and nature. So what if the story is, you know, this high modernism of the colonial state and wanting to control water and control land, and land specifically as sort of as an agricultural sort of land, a resource that, that produces crops rather than land for pastoral use, for instance. Um, how, how, how about the possibility now that that's evolving into a situation where other parts of the colony, which were viewed as um, could not be irrigated, could not be made into arable land, could not be made productive, are now actually the primary sites of extraction of resources. So dry, mountainous regions which are being cut down and mineral resources, this is now the game, or tub. Mm -hmm. which is, is not an old school, let's colonize this place and irrigate its site. Um, so how do you see that in terms of long durée history of, this, of, of the story that you're telling? Um, I mean, I mean, this is not about water, it's actually beyond water. Yeah. And thinking about, you know, sort of the, the fact that this is largely a semi-arid sort of area that you're talking about. Yeah. So now the colonization of nature is taking on perhaps because of technology, because of mm. capitalism's evolving forms, yeah. um, and the fact that you can take big machines <coughs> and cut down dry mountains and get marble and granite mm. and bauxite and iron ores out of it in a way that you couldn't afford. Yeah, I mean, as, certainly if you look at Balochistan and the exploitation of sweet gas over the last several decades, there's a pretty clear colonial relationship between where the capital, where the finance, the military power, and the users of that resource are located, which is in, on the plains, in the Indus Plains, ironically, um, and where that resource comes from, which, as you pointed out, is in the, this mountainous region, which is not suitable for irrigation. Um, I don't know about the, the chronology of this. Um, I suppose it's basically because the tradition of using water to irrigate um, dry, fertile land and create wealth, or at least create subsistence, is about as old as human civilization. Whereas we've only had this spur to go off and look under the rocks in otherwise quite hostile mountain ranges since we got an internal combustion engine. And so I say this is also about technology, you know, technological development. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, just to follow up on that, I think like natural resources uh, from like a geography point of view, critical geography point of view, are not fixed. They depend on the technological frontier. So uh, natural resources are contextually defined as such. I mean, you can look at tar sands in Alberta. Those weren't feasible natural resources before the price for oil hit 160 a barrel. Uh, 
But once they did become that, it enters into the feasible kind of calculations. Mm -hmm. So thinking of natural resources as a flexible sort of range, which becomes feasible or unfeasible given certain conditions. And I think the other side of that is another concept from geography is the spatial fix, yeah. is that basically capital seeks spatial resolutions to its contradictions. And one of these is the uh, basically extension of commodity frontiers, mm -hmm. is you move into new untapped areas or you move into tapped areas and tap them a different way. Uh, but basically you have to keep some pattern of accumulation going. And when there's not enough uh, kind of viable opportunities within the existing system, you expand the frontier. Um, now the question is, uh, is, this, is it possible for this to happen endlessly? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. and then from an ecological perspective, you would say no, there are thresholds which you cannot cross. But if you come from the opposite, kind of radical technological determinism perspective, you might say there's always going to be a rich and a poor. The poor will just get screwed, and the rich will innovate their way out of whatever's going on. Um, but I mean, I guess it's this, it's the old thing, you know, can you imagine the end of the world easier than you can imagine the end of capitalism? Like, um, I think a lot of it depends on this idea of um, absolute thresholds where I think ecological Marxists are making very interesting arguments now. I mean, fracking is sort of an example of someone saying, oh, we'll find new, we'll, we'll extend yeah. the realm of what is possible yeah. via technology. Yeah, yeah. And you can see it in all areas. I mean, like uh, sur surrogacy for birth. I mean, that's like a colonization of bodies in a way. So, I mean, it, it can go in many different directions. Uh, question for Margit. How do you see um, the anti-colonial movement against the state taking form? Um, is it through environmental activism? Uh, do they have an environmental department? Because uh, as far as I know, there's only the World Wildlife Fund that's conducting research in that area. Um, uh, environmental department in, within the government of Pakistan? Yeah, I'm working. A working one. Well, that's a, that's a difficult uh, qualifier. There is a Ministry of Environment. There is, I think, Minister of Climate Change as well. There's an EPA as well. There's an EPA as well. And there are many uh, environmentally conscious movements and livelihood movements with ecological concerns that are on the ground and that are kind of fighting the good fight. And, you know, you can think of Sungi, you can think of Aga Khan. There, there are many organizations working on these issues. Um, I think... Part of the reason, um, and as, as I'm not really an organizer, this is speculation on my part, or just kind of basis of observation, is that a lot of the, the smaller place-based, issue-based struggles um, are not coordinated in a unified front. That might be one of the reasons in domestically, and that also the international linkages have not been as strong. So if you look across the border to India, you can see that many of the environmental movements in India have met with some success, however limited, they've met with more success than in Pakistan, and a lot of that is strategic leveraging of international pressure and international linkages as well. Um, so I think in these two sorts of areas, I, don't, I, I think resistance is ongoing and it's, it's almost knee-jerk. You know, the people will resist, people will defend their interests, they will defend their ecologies. Um, but the question of coordinating and synchronizing that opposition, so it poses a challenge to one of the largest militaries in the world, which is not afraid to use violence, um, that, that's a different sort of question. I think it's worth, um, <clears throat> it's worth also thinking about the relationship between environment, environmentalism, and resistance and livelihoods. Martinez Alia, some while ago, I think 10, 15 years ago, I think, very powerfully set out the idea that southern in environmentalism, in inverted commas, is different from northern environmentalism because it's not about protecting the abstract yeah. concept of the environment or prote protecting um, landscapes for their aesthetic value or because of <coughs> building traditions, it's about livelihoods. It's environmental justice rather than environmentalism in the northern sense. Yeah. Um, and I'd say environmentalism is really decolonial in any meaningful way. I mean, or anti-colonial or whichever term I'm going to use. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and some of the current criticism of Extinction Rebellion is that it would be really expensive and that it would be bad for poor people and that the Extinction Rebellion activists are all middle class people who are worried about poor people. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, there are lots of tensions. Yeah, so I think, I think you've answered a bit of what I was going to ask already. Um, so I'm an anthropology student and something I'm interested in looking at for my PhD is how conservation efforts can be used to justify projects that would be colonial and would be marginalizing. Um, I haven't really looked much at rivers before, um, so is that something that can be an issue with river development? I know I've heard things about hydroelectric dams being justified as, as this is going to be green energy, um, and local communities have had, had differing opinions of that. You know. um, yeah, is, is that something that can become, uh, could be something that could be an issue in, in river management um, projects justified as conservation that turn out to be exploited? Because um, I noticed how you were talking about in the river, in the industry, but you were talking about how these projects were often justified as, as being good for agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think. I, I just made a very quick comment on that. Is if it, I, Pakistani government has been asking, thirsting for large dams for over 70 years. In 2015, there was a kind of coordinated set of publications that said, we want dams because it's good for the environment. You know? So it's kind of like the environmentalist trappings, but the agenda is still the same. So I think in that that's kind of gesturing towards what you're getting at, is the discourse of environmentalism being used to carry out um, dispossession, um, but it seems palatable to donor agencies. It seems pal it looks nice on a brochure, um, so it's a bit of kind of greenwashing is a term that's often used. Um. Sort of like decolonizing the university. <laughs> Hello, um, thank you. My question is more related to uh, future, I guess. Um, in in light of um, the climate change centric policy making, the um, the way we, I mean, the way that we see natural resources are changing, and I was, I was wondering, um, how do you think um, this transition, especially energy transition, the way we see natural resources in light of climate change-related issues, um, affects or changes the way we envision um, colonial power? Nice quick one for the end of the seminar. <laughs> um, it, depends, it depends who we are. I think the, the international debate about climate change, the way that the IPCC functions, uh, I don't think attempts to pose any serious challenge to the existing international order. And because climate change is such a big, like an overwhelmingly big issue, and again, quite an abstract issue, I mean, with very, very concrete effects, but we're not talking about a particular protein <coughs> in a, a particular place seeking an action that is easily attainable or resolvable. So I'm not sure I see that much likelihood of climate change being reached to uh, decolonial agendas while the terms of the climate change debate remain what they are, which is about getting governments to agree to targets to reduce emissions and keep uh, temperature rise within a certain hour by a certain time. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. There's a great book out by uh, Jeff Mann and Joel Wainwright called Climate Leviathan, which takes the unpopular premise as its starting point that there won't be effective action against climate change. It's not going to happen. We've actually known the facts for about 30 years, um, and we still, it's not a new emergency. That future of climate disaster is actually our present in many parts of the world. It's, it's already happening. The, the Delta I mentioned is just one of those sorts of examples. And so he kind of <coughs> does a speculative experiment on what future forms of government might look like. Um, some, and three of the options, there are four options, three of them are very dystopian, uh, just to kind of give away the plot line. 
Um, but I think if, if we're gonna talk about kind of effective action, it's stuff that people are afraid to talk about, which is mass redistribution. Uh, mass redistribution on the international level and in the domestic level. Mass redistribution of wealth and also protection. You know, um, like it's, the, the, the storm is already coming and it doesn't look like we're doing anything. So my cynical, pessimistic view is that the action that can be taken right now is to protect the weakest on every scale. Like it's too late to stop the steamroller. No one is making any convincing noises. Um, so maybe that, and again, this is a bit of a polemical point, uh, that maybe our energies are best spent on insulating um, on protecting the most vulnerable and then trying to think of a project from there. But in terms of getting the capitalists and the militarists who run the world to voluntarily give up power, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. I think the world will end before that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I have a book chapter that actually tries its best to crunch the numbers on there's no physical water scarcity in Pakistan. The, the, the numbers are just, they don't add up. But the Indus is a massive river. The, the problems are of access, of infrastructure, of management. Um, the, it's a Malthusian discourse that, you know, there's not enough to go around. And in Pakistan, you hear this all the time, too many people, too many mouths. It's just, it's nonsense. It doesn't, it doesn't match the numbers. Food production, we've never produced more food in Pakistan and globally than we are right now. It's not a question of supply, it's a question of distribution. There might be localized cases of absolute scarcity, but those are solvable by distribution type things. And, and as far as the Amr Basha Dam goes, um, I mean, we've all seen what happened to the Chief Justice Dam Fund. I think last time he came to England, he couldn't get enough people to give a talk, you know. Um, so I think that was a publicity stunt and has been showed as, shown as such. And uh, there are other types of solutions other than mega dams. For example, the Indo-Gangetic Plains sits on one of the largest natural underground water storages in the world. You know, California, Arizona, they store a lot of the water underground and then pump it up. So we have that, and you know, so there's something spectacular about a large dam that has captured the imagination for over a hundred years. And I think that explains what's going on more so than any sort of optimal engineering. Yeah. Okay, let, maybe we should take a last set of few questions. So that we, maybe one, two, three, four. Sorry, so quick question. Uh, what was the name of the book you just mentioned? Climate Leviathan. Yeah, and uh, he'll be coming to the historical materialism conference here in a couple of weeks, so you can see him speak then yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you. I enjoyed both of your presentations a lot. But it did make me think that this entire conversation has been around water and agriculture. And as I see it, sort of the newly emerging side of water politics is actually the cities. Um, mm. And particularly the suburbs and these sort of booming housing real estate <coughs> markets, like which are sort of mushrooming uh, all across Pakistan. And not only does that 
I think it generates a very different kind of what politics are and what as well because you know it's very it's much more intimate. Uh, we're talking about sort of neighbor neighborhood to neighborhood. Look at Karachi as an example, for instance, like the new Beria town sort of monstrosity that is coming up right on the outskirts of the you know the current boundaries of Karachi is going to take away a very significant chunk of the water that is actually present for the city at the moment, which is already an extremely scarce and contested resource. <coughs> so I think it's just, yeah, I just want to bring up that sort of the politics around water is also happening a very uh, sort yeah. of turbulently uh, in urban sites and yeah. is probably going to become, to, to intensify as time goes on. Yeah, and, and I completely agree. It's a whole new scene and new types of politics and resistances will emerge out of that. Also something else related, quality is something we didn't mention either, which is a big thing in urban water supply. You might be drinking water, but it's killing you, you know? So that's another thing that is kind of a slow death rather than absolute water scarcity, which we didn't touch on, and which is not covered in this water treaty either, by the way. So. And in fact, municipal water supply is one of the blind spots in the treaty because it specifies municipal uses are allowed, but that's envisaging very light uses. Yeah, you, you talked about Mongolia now. Yeah. And um, it's clear that, you know, more scarcity, scarcity isn't a problem in Hansa. So why was it constructed and why were so many people displaced? And could you touch upon the whole piece of about Because you said there was enough food. <coughs> yeah, um, just, just very quickly because we're running out of time. Um, the Mangla Dam and Inde Terbila Dam were both created as replacement works, uh, which means basically, or maybe one was... They tried to get their bill to be considered development as well. But basically, the three eastern tributaries went to India. The three western stayed with Pakistan. Pakistan said, if we're going to give these three rivers away, we need to dam these other rivers so we can get replacement waters. Because the Sutlej and Ravi were watering fields in east and south of Pakistan. So that, that was the main reason. Plus, everyone in the world was crazy about dams at that time. They were seen as uh, solving every problem, you know. Um, I mean, uh, Adam Curtis has a great documentary on YouTube called Black Power, which is about Kwame Nkrumah's dam to uh, quest to build the Volta River. Um, and then what was your other question? Um, oh, uh, check out the work of Roger Ballard. Uh, he's written on the visa scheme for Mirapuris. And I think I've read that Mirapuris constitute something like 60-70% of Asian uh, Pakistani Brits, actually. So it's a large part of the Pakistani Brit community. Um, so this idea of um, colonizing national resources, and it's just still apparent today, how has this affected, how deeply um, rooted is it in ethno-nationalism in, in Pakistan? Mm. Has it heightened it even further, like the divide between the North and the South and the Punjabis and the South? Mm. You could just touch upon that a little bit. Yeah. 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 A lot, basically. So <laughs> Majid mentioned you can read the Indus Waters dispute all the way back to the 1930s, which was the Anderson Commission, which attempted to get the government of Bombay, which was in charge of Sindh at the time, and the government of Punjab to agree on water allocation. And they never agreed. And this is one of the reasons that the international dispute got so heated later on. And um, within Pakistan, the Sindhis were always complaining that their interests weren't being properly represented in the international um, uh, negotiations. Interestingly, in India, Punjab felt left out and claimed that the central government was sending engineers who weren't looking after Indian Punjab's interests. And although Indian Punjab is upstream of the other major riparians, which were basically in modern times Haryana and Rajasthan, uh, there was a very tense relationship internally in India between Punjab and these other um, these other units. Yeah. So and again, you know, scene of um, violent ethno nationalist insurgency in the eighties. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, Indus is called Duryai Sindh in Pakistan. So the Sindhis have an organic claim to it. And there have been, it has been at the center of kind of ethno-regionalist or ethno-nationalist things. I think that makes sense. If you are a ethno-regionalized minority and you see your natural wealth being sucked <coughs> away and using to enrich the core regions, um, which we might call Central Punjab and Karachi, then I think this sort of feeling, uh, it would be surprising if it weren't there. 
although India is also named after the Indus. Uh -huh. Yes, that's true. So that's true. Continent, continent. So maybe Pakistan has a claim to all of India. Then. <laughs> that's the wet dream of well, every country. <laughs> 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 okay, I'll leave <be> <laughs>